Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Free History. I'm Will Hickox of the Watkins Museum of History, and I'm host of the series Free History. This series is a collaboration between the Hall Center for the Humanities, Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area, Humanities Kansas, the Watkins Museum of History, and the University of Kansas Department of African and African American Studies. This year marks the 200th anniversary of the Santa Fe Trail, which of course went through uh, what is now Kansas City and Lawrence. Uh, this event is also being held because we, uh, next month here at the Watkins Museum, will be uh, debuting an exhibit about a local restaurant, Chico's Tacos, which enjoyed a lot of popularity in the middle years of the 20th century. So in, in uh, anticipation of this exhibit, we've invited local food scholar, Jean T. Chavez, to speak today about Mexican-American food in the Kansas City area and its uh, cultural and historical significance. Uh, Gene consults on diversity issues as president of Chavez and Associates. He also gives a presentation called Flower Power, which we'll get a taste of here in a moment, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. uh, we encourage you, the audience members, to get involved by posting questions down at the bottom of your screen um, in the Q&A feature. And now uh, I'd like to start the main event. So I'll start off by saying hello, Gene, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm great. Uh, pleasure being with you. Likewise. Uh, Gene, uh, before we launch into your presentation, I wonder if you could start off by telling us something about yourself, uh, your background, and uh, just how you came to study this uh, culture and history of Mexican-American cuisine. Well, uh, I grew up in uh, Denver and uh, with uh, frequent trips to northern New Mexico, where my grandparents lived uh, in the uh, small mining town of Raton, New Mexico. Uh, and uh, of course, that was also on the Santa Fe Trail. Um, but uh, when uh, I would go down to New Mexico and uh, visit grandparents, they always had the most uh, wonderful food. And of course, my mom cooked some of it. but uh, with every uh, succeeding generation, you usually lose something. So it was always wonderful to go and uh, try uh, my grandmother's recipes. She had kind of a routine. She would uh, bake bread because her uh, husband and sons worked in, in the coal mines in Raton. Uh, she always baked bread on Wednesday and she would make these wonderful uh, bizcochitos, which was a New Mexico uh, cookie, sugar cookie uh, with anise, uh, anise, we say in Spanish. Uh, and then one of the other New Mexico favor, uh, favorites of mine was the chile adobado, uh, which was uh, thinly sliced um, pork uh, or beef uh, marinated in, in chili. And then uh, when you get ready to cook it, you fry it and uh, man, it makes a wonderful meal. Of course, you always had the frijoles and uh, and fresh tortillas for every meal. My mom <laughs> made fresh tortillas. And so I think that was one of the things that sparked my interest in, well, where did uh, the whole idea of tortillas come from? And so that's how I uh, got involved with uh, studying that aspect of uh, Mexican culture. And I believe that you actually have a, a presentation ready to go for us. Yes. If you would like to start that up and, and tell us about this uh, subject of the tortilla and uh, Mexican-American cuisine. Okay. Uh, do you see the PowerPoint? I do. Okay. Well, uh, I call it flower power because uh, I thought that would appeal to Kansans, especially since we are a great uh, producing flour, uh, wheat producing state from which we get our uh, milled flour and um, so when I proposed it to the Humanities Kansas to do this program, uh, I thought of, of the name Flower Power, uh, the history of the tortilla. But of course, uh, corn is very much involved and we are certainly a corn growing state. So um, when we think about um, the story of, uh, or the history of the tortilla, the story really starts um, way back in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and when you think about uh, Iberia, which contains Portugal and Spain, um, you see how close it is 
uh, to uh, Northern Africa. And I, I uh, visited Spain some years back and I took a fast ferry uh, across from the Straits of, uh, there the, uh, across the Straits of Gibraltar from Southern Spain over to Morocco. Uh, and what I discovered, it took me about 35 minutes, about the same time it takes me to drive from my house in Lenexa to Lawrence. So that's how close Northern Africa is to the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and uh, what, what I uh, found in researching is that uh, milled flour uh, mixed with ground chickpea uh, was used by the Mediterranean uh, people of the Mediterranean region to make what the Spanish called tortillitas, um, which uh, simply meant in uh, the Castellano language, uh, little cakes or a flatbread. Uh, and uh, historians um, tell us that uh, the people from Northern Africa inhabited Spain for 750 years, uh, from 750 AD to uh, the reconquest of Spain by Isabella and Ferdinand uh, in 1492. And that's, uh, of course, when Christopher Columbus uh, was financed by Spain to launch his exploration of the Americas. Uh, and so the uh, cultural exchange, I guess, between Spain and the Americas began uh, at that time. In some parts of Spain, um, the uh, bread, uh, that flat bread is sometimes called a torta, or uh, in Mexico, there's uh, what they call a torta, which is like a uh, flattened French roll uh, made into a sandwich. Um, and in Spain, uh, some places in Spain especially, when you ask for a tortilla, the way we call it in the United States, you would likely get a, uh, an egg omelet because that's what they, uh, they call a tortilla in Spain now. Uh, so uh, certainly the, uh, the origin of the word tortilla comes from the Iberian Peninsula. Now, after the uh, uh, exploration of Christopher Columbus, uh, and, and then the colonization by Spain uh, of the Americas, there were in fact uh, much opportunities for food uh, exchange. Uh, for example, the potato uh, was not something that was known in Europe. Uh, corn as we know it in the Americas was not known uh, in Europe. Uh, and so that uh, food exchange, that cultural exchange uh, which included food began to take place. I, I like uh, in uh, Cortez's, um, who conquered the uh, great uh, Aztec empire, by the way, the Aztec called themselves Mexica, that was the name for themselves, but uh, they're commonly referred to as the Aztec empire. And that's really after they formed uh, an allegiance with other city-states in Mesoamerica. And, and uh, uh, they became then uh, known as a conquering nation and um, the term Azteca applied to them. But Cortez in uh, 1520, while he was um, in the process of conquering uh, the great Aztec empire, he wrote a letter to Charles uh, V, Carlos V of Spain, uh, to describe what he found in the great marketplace of Tenochtitlan, which is of course today Mexico City. Um, uh, Cortez says, this city has many public squares in which are situated the markets and other places for buying and selling, uh, where daily assembled are, are more than 60,000 souls and where are found all kinds of merchandise that the world affords, embracing the necessities of life. And for instance, articles of food, maize and or Indian corn in the in grain or in the form of bread. There he was describing probably for the first time uh, to a European monarch, uh, what uh, later became known as the tortilla made out of maize uh, cornmeal. Uh, by the time uh, that uh, Philip II of Spain uh, took the throne, uh, the Spanish empire uh, had expanded uh, exponentially, and uh, we see that uh, by this map, how far north 
uh, from the Iberian Peninsula and, and down into South, into South America, uh, the uh, empire or the vice royalties of, of Spain, of New Spain had expanded uh, so that the people from Spain um, came uh, to the Americas and dispersed, bringing uh, their custom and their food ways uh, with them. Uh, and so when they saw the indigenous people making a similar flat cake that they saw the um, people of Northern Africa, uh, the Moors uh, and, and other uh, people groups from Northern Africa, uh, they were making a similar flat cake, but they saw the Indians making it out of maize, what they called maize, uh, in uh, different parts of uh, Latin America, Mesoamerica, and, and certainly South America. Uh, each of those indigenous groups had different names for what they called their flat bread. For example, in Mexico, uh, the, the uh, tortillas that you see to the right on this picture uh, were called laxcali uh, in the Nahuatl language, which was the language of the uh, principal group uh, of Central Mexico that called themselves Mexica. In Central America, uh, the Indian people were make, using uh, similar corn which they call choclo in especially the Andes. Uh, and they were making uh, what they called pupusa in their language. And uh, further south in, in uh, South America, that was Central America and South America, uh, the uh, indigenous people were making this flatbread that they called arepa. Uh, so uh, each of the uh, various cultures all up and down uh, what later became known as Las Americas or the Americas uh, were in fact uh, using uh, corn in or as a, a flatbread as a very uh, principal part of their, their diet. Uh, now it's important for us to understand something about tortilla making that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and, and that's a process that's called uh, nixtamalization. And I'll give us some details on that in, in just a second. But uh, the, the process for making tortilla really starts out of corn, starts with the soaking of the corn in lime water or lye, uh, uh, which is uh, same as uh, lime water. Uh, lye, of course, is a naturally occurring element uh, in certain kinds of stone like limestone. Um, but also lye uh, can be produced uh, by uh, using, uh, by leaching uh, the ashes of firewood uh, so that when um, uh, you burn a fire using wood uh, and then leach that out uh, comes uh, what is called lime water or lye. Uh, I can remember uh, my grandmother in New Mexico uh, doing this process to make soap. So uh, I never wanted to have my mouth washed out with lye soap uh, because uh, it, it had a certain sting to it. But uh, so that's that process of producing lime water. Uh, and then the maize is soaked in lime water. Uh, after it soaks uh, and, and comes to a boil, uh, it is put um, in ancient times on a stone mano y metate, which is a mortar of, uh, process in order to grind the stone. And in this picture, we see uh, two girls uh, participating in the tortilla making process as they pat the masa, which is produced uh, from the ground mill, uh, and uh, then cooked on a comal using the language of the Nahuatl, which they called uh, their grills, usually stone grills, uh, comal or comales. Uh, going to the, the idea of the uh, next tamalization, it's a very important process uh, when you're using um, corn, uh, because corn uh, naturally um, uh, has a, uh, a very tough coating that really uh, blocks the nutrients. So often when we eat corn on the cob, for example, it really has very little nutri uh, nutritional value for us. But what we like probably is the butter, salt, and pepper that we put on the corn uh, to make it uh, you know, a, a, a seasonal favorite. But uh, next tamalization, the Indians learned very on and were using this process uh, when, they in, when the Spanish encountered them. Uh, so the uh, corn tortilla 
uh, is prepared by the soaking of the um, corn in lye water uh, or lime water, and that is that begins the next tamalization process. Uh, the the um, uh, next tamalization process unlocks proteins and uh, uh, allows for the making of masa, which is just the Spanish word for dough, uh, by removing uh, the hull of the corn. Uh, so then eating uh, maize-based foods without next tamalization or some type of uh, supplementation for protein uh, like legumes or meat, uh, it really uh, loses its nutritional value. So, uh, and, and often causes in um, people who have corn as their principal, for their principal diet, uh, uh, polygra uh, polygraia, uh, which is in fact a uh, disease of the skin and can, uh, can affect people negatively in, in a lot of ways. Um, sailors often got this when they sailed long distances without fresh fruit, vegetables, or protein, and protein, and, and they called it uh, scurvy. Uh, so it, it was something that uh, the Indians learned to avoid by the next tamalization process. Well, that brings us to the question of, uh, well, what is the origin of flour tortillas, which are so very popular in the United States and bec have become a staple in almost every household. Wheat flour uh, tortillas probably were an innovation of exiled Spanish Jews uh, who were uh, conversos. Uh, that is, they were people uh, who were given the ultimatum, um, ultimatum by Queen Isabella and Fernando and that Christian regime that either you convert to Christianity uh, or uh, you have to get out of Spain. Many of the Sephardic Jews or Spanish Jews uh, went to Turkey in order that they uh, could continue practicing Judaism. Uh, but those who decided they wanted to come to the Americas uh, uh, became uh, uh, converts or conversos as we say in Spanish. Uh, and, and they came to the Americas and especially in the Northern part of the Viceroyalty of New Spain which would take in uh, today's uh, states of Nuevo Leon, uh, uh, Chihuahua, uh, and uh, uh, Sonora. And so the northern part of, of the, uh, what is today Mexico, is where many of the Sephardic Jews settled. And uh, when they saw the uh, Indians eating this corn and then the Spanish feeding that corn uh, to pigs, uh, I think they felt like it wasn't kosher. It wasn't something that was allowed in their diet. And so they began uh, uh, using wheat. Uh, they had brought uh, some seeds from Europe uh, to produce uh, a certain kind of wheat flour and began to mill their own uh, wheat. And for that, uh, they uh, began to make this flatbread that we call today flour tortillas. Uh, so these conversos, uh, really had an influence on Northern Mexico. Uh, when, you, um, when you go to Mexico, uh, you'll find corn tortillas of many different varieties uh, in the North. And you'll also find some flour tortillas. But for the most part, uh, when you go into Central or Southern Mexico, it's almost exclusively corn tortillas that people eat. Uh, so the, uh, for the uh, uh, people of the North, of Mexico and what was in fact Northern Mexico all the way up uh, until uh, the Spanish, uh, rather the uh, war of uh, Mexico and the United States that was settled by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, Mexican border was moved south from uh, the Arkansas River down to the Rio Grande River as a result of that war. And Mexico, of course, lost all of those northern territories. So the people uh, of that uh, changing border, uh, while the border, the political border changed, the cultural boundaries and borders were really pretty much the same. So the people who remained, like my ancestors, who came from Spain and settled uh, in uh, New Me what is today New Mexico, uh, the northernmost uh, reaches of the Spanish Empire, uh, they were already making flour tortillas. 
and as I mentioned, my mother made uh, flour tortillas like every day for every meal that we had. Uh, so um, today, uh, the tortilla industry uh, has really, uh, really uh, raised the stakes uh, in its strategy uh, as uh, the fastest uh, growing uh, market uh, of the baking industry or sector of the, of the baking industry. So tortillas uh, recorded last year $12 billion in sales. I'm talking about both corn and flour tortillas and are overtaking uh, white sandwich bread as the nation's, uh, and I love this statement, preferred food delivery platform. Uh, so uh, when you think about uh, tortillas, it can, you can roll them up into a burrito, uh, you can uh, uh, warm them and um, use them as little scoops. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that uh, you can use tortillas, both flour and corn. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm sometimes asked, uh, why are a lot of the people who have Mexican restaurants in uh, places like Kansas or Nebraska or Iowa, uh, why do they use as their uh, signature dishes uh, flour tortillas instead of corn tortillas? Why do they make enchiladas, for example, out of flour tortillas rather than corn tortillas? And, and the answer for that is, is that um, the process of, of uh, mass producing tortillas of uh, corn uh, takes that next tamalization process. And, and in order to make and distribute large numbers of tortillas to, for, for example, to restaurants, uh, they really, um, you have to have a factory operation. And so uh, as, as uh, Mexican people began to start their own tortillerias, uh, like Arts Mexican Products in uh, Kansas City, Kansas, uh, who uses the uh, next tamalization process, uh, they, uh, they make uh, lots of tortillas that are distributed in our region uh, for uh, consumption, not only by uh, customers, but by in fact restaurants uh, and uh, people who use large numbers of tortillas. Uh, I'm gonna play just a, a short video that uh, gives us an insight into the process of making uh, corn tortillas commercially. These are 35 pound uh, balls of masa that are getting ready to put into the press that stamps them out into tortillas or chips, depending on what they're making that day. This is the uh, grinding mill after the corn has been soaked and the husks washed away. So the corn is being milled. And what the uh, owner there is holding in her hand is called masa. This gentleman is rolling up those 35 uh, balls of masa, getting them ready for the uh, stamping machine. Here the tortillas are being stamped out. And they uh, are run through uh, a uh, gas operated oven or orno as they call it. And they are cooked on this conveyor belt on both sides all at the same time. You notice that they actually make a round, they go around twice, and then they're dropped on another conveyor belt and packed. Each uh, package contains five dozen tortillas, corn tortillas. They're then put into uh, boxes for shipping to restaurants and other uh, places that use um, tortillas in large quantities. So there's a uh, view of the uh, next tamalization uh, corn tortilla uh, 
making uh, process. This particular factory makes about 40,000 tortillas in one day and distributes them throughout the region. <clears throat> now there is a uh, tortilla uh, association called uh, TIA or the uh, Tortilla in Industry Association. It's a not-for-profit and their major mission is to maximize the success uh, of all its members uh, and, rec and is recognized as a leader uh, in uh, promoting the tortilla industry. And as I mentioned, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and in, and in fact growing. Uh, I mentioned that I had been in Spain uh, some years back. Uh, I looked all over Spain for a Mexican restaurant uh, just to see if they had, had a Mexican restaurant. And the only Mexican restaurant I found was in the capital city of Madrid. Uh, and uh, so they had to import a lot of uh, the stuff that they were using in their Mexican restaurant. And it was a Mexican family that was running the operation. Uh, so it, uh, uh, it but uh, tortilla making and uh, on a large scale, as well as the whole industry is growing worldwide. Um, I thought a, a little local history uh, might be interesting. Uh, in a uh, master's uh, thesis uh, written by uh, Jennifer Brecken um, back in uh, 2008 and copyrighted 2009, uh, her uh, study was on uh, the history of restaurants in Lawrence. And uh, she writes, the first ethnic restaurants in Lawrence opened around 1950. Mexican cuisine was first on the scene in El Tampico Club. Uh, now, uh, we'll mention another restaurant that maybe started before this one, but in her study, she mentions this one. Uh, the, in, in East Lawrence on Pennsylvania, 8th and Pennsylvania. It was the only uh, ethnic restaurant listed in the telephone directory in that year. She used the telephone di directory as part of her study of those eras. Uh, La uh, Tropicana on North, uh, in North Lawrence on 4th and Locust uh, opened its doors in 1951 and was still operating in 2008. And then she mentions a third Mexican restaurant, El Matador Cafe, uh, opened in 19, uh, around 1950, uh, adjacent to the Tropicana. And those of you who live in Lawrence, uh, maybe you've been to some of these restaurants and can tell us about it. Uh, but uh, Mexican food has just become more and more popular uh, throughout the years. Uh, and it's not surprising if some of these restaurants are still operating today, even though I know El Chico, it no longer operates in Lawrence. But um, the uh, Mexican food business, uh, both uh, 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 authentic as well as um, a what I call approximations of Mexican food are proliferating throughout the country. Um, so the future of tortillas continues as uh, people crave Mexican food um, so that they spend billions of dollars annually uh, in quick service restaurants like Taco Bell, Chipotle Grill, Me and other Mexican food places and in grocery stores. Authentic Mexican restaurants continue to grow uh, and food uh, product distributors continue to grow throughout the United States and worldwide. Uh, corn tortillas are the preferred and most popular in Mexico, uh, and flour tortillas are the most popular uh, food delivery platform in the United States. So with that, I'll uh, pause. There's a few questions that maybe people would like to respond to. What is your favorite uh, family recipe for tortillas if you make tortillas? Um, I have a little video uh, <clears throat> where I uh, demonstrate how to make tortillas. My mom always used uh, uh, pork lard, uh, and uh, people always claim that that makes the best tortilla as well as uh, pie dough. Uh, and of course, uh, vegetable short shortening came in to vogue for a while, uh, and now it's vegetable oil. So any of those would work uh, in the, the making of tortillas. Uh, what brand of tortillas, if you buy tortillas at the store, are your favorite? Uh, do you prefer corn or flour tortillas? And uh, what is your 
uh, how does your favorite restaurant serve tortillas? Uh, I know there's a new restaurant in Lawrence called uh, uh, La Potre, which is in, in fact means the little pony uh, in, uh, in Lawrence um, out, out by Highway 10. And uh, they make fresh tortillas every day for their Mexican food. So uh, I would certainly recommend that restaurant. Um, so here's a recipe that I have uh, for the versatile, versatile dough. Uh, you can either make flour tortillas out of this, or you can also uh, deep fry them and make uh, sopapilla out of this same uh, flour dough. All right, Will, I'm gonna stop with that and uh, I'll, quit sharing and then we could talk and answer questions. Well, thank you, Jean. Um, uh, just an observation before we get into some questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, La Tropicana, um, which was still open as of 2008, uh, according to that uh, master's thesis. It is still open today. It's on the north side of, of Lawrence across the river from us. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, a fun fact is that it's owned by, the, I believe by the same family that owned uh, Chico's Tacos uh, oh. several decades ago. So that legacy is still going on, which is nice yeah. to see. Yeah. Great. So we have some observations here. Uh, so Dorothy um, was taken by something you said. Uh, did you say that corn tortillas are more expensive to make than wheat? And could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? More expensive to make? Um, well, yes and no. Uh, if, um, if in fact uh, you buy corn tortillas, they are made in such large quantities uh, that you can really purchase them quite inexpensively. Uh, so uh, for example, I go to a little um, store uh, in Shawnee, uh, Kansas, uh, near where I live, and uh, I can buy, and they usually sell them in uh, three dozen at a time. So that's how they package them. Uh, and uh, I can usually buy three dozen uh, for about uh, $4.50. $4 so um, if I were to buy uh, flour tortillas um, at the grocery store, uh, I'm probably paying a, a little less for 20 tortillas. You know, I, I like the Mission brand because they, they tend to be a little thicker and I like a thicker tortilla. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, you know, there you can get those for anywhere from uh, 325 to 360 for 20 tortillas. So they're, I think flour tortillas are actually a little more expensive. Interesting, interesting. So we're starting to run, we um, have gone past our time slightly, but I wanted to ask you, Gene, if you could elaborate a little bit more about uh, the history of, of, Mexi of tortillas in Mexican-American food in the Kansas City area. So when did um, Mexican-American food like tortillas uh, first make its way to that to the area? And um, when did it become really popular? Yeah, well, uh, you know, the uh, Mexican Revolution uh, really brought uh, more than a million people uh, or dispersed more than a million people. M many of them came to the United States. Some went to Spain and other countries, but, uh, you know, depending on their um, their class uh, level. Uh, a lot of people who had roots in Spain went back to Spain uh, during the Mexican Revolution, but a lot of uh, Mexicans came to the United States uh, and, and they were often greeted uh, during that period, 1910 to 1921, uh, uh, which was the period of the revolution. Uh, but on, even until 1930, uh, 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 labor contractors would actually meet Mexicans at the border or go down into Mexico to say, hey, uh, the railroad needs you, the meatpacking uh, industry needs you. Uh, so uh, a lot of people re were recruited uh, to come to Kansas City, both with the railroad and the meatpacking that was taking place here. Uh, and it was during that period that a lot of people just made their own flour tortillas. Uh, and often they didn't, uh, make corn tortillas because it's a more complicated process. And, and so that's um, when I think um, the, uh, the people began to migrate here from Mexico. Uh, and, and then as um, uh, a market uh, uh, developed, people, entrepreneurs <clears throat> began to set up their own uh, uh, tortilla 
tortillerias, we call them in Spanish, or tortilla shops, where they could use the uh, next tamalization by a small machine <coughs> and begin producing uh, corn tortillas. <coughs> Well, that's very interesting. So, Gene, uh, we're, we're just about out of time here. So I just want to thank you very much for taking a part of, taking a part of your Saturday uh, evening but, and sharing uh, your knowledge with us about this very delicious topic. So thank yeah. you very much. All right. But, uh, I urge everybody to, to make, try making their own. And uh, yeah, you can find recipes online. So, and then they can also turn to Nuestra Herencia KC and I have uh, I have a video on there, and we can find them online uh, uh, or on Facebook. And, uh, Facebook on Facebook, yeah. Fantastic. Well, we I'll be sure to check that out. All right. So uh, yeah, thank you, Gene, and thank you to everyone who joined us today for this great event. Uh, registrants to the Zoom webinar will receive a link to a survey, and filling out that survey will help us to improve this ongoing series. So. Uh, we really appreciate your taking the time to do that. So with that, I'll just say goodbye and uh, we'll see you for the next program. Adios.